Ooh. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Kennedy. I am the biological sciences lead for the expedition, and I think my favorite thing was probably the Tudiscarium, the Radiolarian we saw really early in the expedition because I was just had was completely stumped. The internet had to tell me what it was. I didn't even know what phylum to start looking at to ID it. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Chris, I'm the data logger on the Nautilus, and I don't know, my favorite thing, this has all been amazing because it's all pretty new, but I really like the snailfish. Oh, the with the Muppet face, yeah. so cute. Lynette, what about you? Uh, favorite thing so far in this expedition and who you are? I'm Lynette, I'm the navigator. Favorite thing this expedition, submerged coconut for sure. <laughs> So if anybody's watching on Sat Feed 3, we have Megan Cook, our comms lead, um, walking around taking photos of everybody. You can see her hand just kind of waving. <laughs> Daryl, what's been your favorite part of this expedition so far? Sitting in the Herc chair right now. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. There we go. Hi, guys. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, sir. Cool. Yes, my favorite part so far being in the heart chair. <laughs> and then the laser chair. Those are the two spots I never thought I'd be in, but it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, Ren, what about you? Oh, I don't know. This entire cruise has been Sorry. truly an amazing experience. It's hard to pick one moment, but I think if I had to narrow in, it would be the handful of times I was able to take an actual real-life sample using the craft manipulator arm. That was pretty amazing. That was so outstanding to watch you get to uh, operate the Hercules manipulator arm and take samples. As a geologist, I fully believe you have a future in picking up rocks. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I'm so excited to start my rock picking up career. <laughs> and Dan, can we toss it over to you now? Yeah. yeah. Too. No. I know. How about now? Yes. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, sorry. Huh. Yeah, all good. What's this button do, there? <laughs> lots of buttons over here. Um, probably my favorite part of this expedition has been watching this team go from um, walking on the boat, deer in the headlights look, to um, yeah, sitting in the front row just crushing it. That's been uh, it's been an amazing journey. It's, we've had trials and tribulations and laughter and tears and. It's, for me, my favorite part of this, uh, the whole Nautilus experience is, is uh, that part of it, watching, watching the learning experience happen and getting to be a part of the ride. Yeah, that was, that was very well put, so eloquent. Yeah. Couldn't have done it without you, Dan. Yeah. Couldn't <laughs> have done it without you, Ben. And you did crush that rock, literally. <laughs> <laughs> we don't we don't have to talk about that one. <laughs> so we have what another hour of blue water before we hit the surface. Uh, no, what does the utility to say? Closer to an hour and a half. One thousand. An hour and a half. Wow, hour and a half. So hour and a half to be 5.30, perfect time to get off watch yeah. and go help out right. or go eat some dinner then. Yeah. On watch. Nice. I like it. <laughs> what can you do with dark light? 
So on our steam back, let's see how many puzzles we could possibly manage to finish it up. I'm enjoying the Hawaiian puzzle. Maybe break back out the hydrothermal vent puzzle. I don't no. think anyone no, wants no, to that puzzle. <laughs> we don't want that puzzle back. Definitely not that puzzle. <laughs> but, but it was so Nautilus themed. Yeah, except it was bad imagery. <laughs> we have much better imagery of hydrothermal vents. I don't know how old that picture was, but yeah, it was I didn't old take it on still cam. Yeah, it was an old so bad. Death, terrible image. I gotta say, Corley, you were rocking the still cam imagery. You know, Megan has been showing everyone that still cam image I took of the uh, of the Muppet snailfish. Yeah. Yes. She's like, look at this cool picture. I'm like, I took that. <laughs> that was the perfect photo to like kind of highlight the dive was that on our watch she took that yeah picture? i don't remember that one snailfish cute. yeah i'll show you a picture how could you not remember <laughs> <laughs> he's well, an engineer all the vertebrates look the same <laughs> just that and corley has probably taken like 3.5 million pictures by now. <laughs> i might have to add that one i have a, a wall in my house of deep sea animals yeah. um, as art, and that one may have to get added to it. It's been very cool to actually use the digital stills camera as a digital stills camera. Yeah. A lot we do the uh, set it and forget it thing, which is, uh, we don't get nearly the uh, quality pictures that you've been taking. Yeah, yeah. no, I really liked using mm -hmm. it a lot. You can add that to your resume, yeah. underwater for, Underwater photographer. Deep there sea you photographer. go. Deep sea photographer. Yeah. Deep sea photographer. That has a <laughs> ring to it. I'm going to add so that to my Instagram bio right <laughs> now. <laughs> is this the first expedition that the still camera has been used? No, yeah. we've had it for a couple of years now, but um, the workflow has kind of been an evolutionary process. And um, in the beginning, it was indeed set it and forget it. Um, the creator of that thing, Andrew Thurber, was using it to uh, take a whole bunch of still pictures of bacterial mat. And um, the idea was he, he would, you know, do a, what do you call it when you put all the pictures together? Mosaic. Mosaic, yeah. And oh. then he would come back and visit that every year. It's off the coast of uh, Oregon. Go ahead, Bridge. And see you know, how, how it had changed, bigger or smaller. Yeah, but we're at about 1,000 meters, but we're coming up slow. So still about an hour and a half until the surface. Yep. What areas change and why they change and all the science involved in that. So uh, that's how we originally started using it. Um, we were getting uh, some good pictures, but a whole lot of, you know, not very good pictures. We're definitely getting some good images right now with Corley at the helm of the camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there were a couple, there was a couple, you know, to that learning curve one, us being, becoming familiar with the camera and how it operates. At first we were challenged just to turn the thing on. <laughs> and now that we kind of have figured that out, Leela wrote up the kind of the workflow document there. Um, it's, it's we're starting to use it more often like you were using it. So Tim Burbank just entered the chat online and he says that, sorry, the still camera timer isn't working the way it's supposed to, but appreciate you all for taking photos with more Aww. finesse. Hi, Tim. Hi, hey, Tim. So what you're saying is something was broken and we fixed it <laughs> <laughs> without you. <laughs> I wouldn't even say fixed it. It got upgraded. Yeah, Ooh. upgraded. Add a little wetware and get it to work better. Sorry, Tim, you're out of a job. <laughs> oh, Tim. Uh, we have another project for when you come back. We have the uh, Rios singing and dancing in the PDU cabinet. Data in, data out. What is that? The uh, we've recently upgraded our power distribution unit that's down there in the little room off of the wet lab. That's where we take the um, the ship's voltage and step it up to high voltage and 
send it down the 6-8 to Atlanta and Hercules. And uh, Robert added some um, gizmos that uh, can tell what the input voltage and current is and also the output voltage and current. So we have a nice Grafana page that has um, 2.6 kilovolts and the associated amperage. Historically, the only data we had is that picture you see of a camera looking at the cabinet, the gauges on the front of the cabinet. Oh. So massive upgrade then. Yeah, serious upgrade. Robert spent uh, yeah, days and days with his head poked into that cabinet. So for those that made the styrofoam cups in the in the van, how did your styrofoam cups turn out? And Dan, I heard that you sacrificed your laundry sack for us. Yeah, I seem to sacrifice one every year. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Did you sacrifice it again for uh, our second round of cups? I did, yeah. Ren, Ren put some holes in it for me. <laughs> I only used the holes that were already there. <laughs> the drawstring is gone, though. That's definitely gone. Uh, yeah. No, it worked out. Um, we're pretty happy it worked out the first time. So hopefully the uh, hopefully they come back safe and sound for the second round, second go round. Yeah, I made my cup. It it looks like a, a rainbow bathymetry guillot, and then I thought it turned out really cool. The second one, I tried to draw a chana cops after seeing Annie's beautiful work of art styrofoam cup. And I'm afraid it looks like a pink otter on its on its tummy. Looking at all the cups are, is always very interesting. The, all the different uh, designs and all the epic fails and the awesome <laughs> <laughs> the, the awesome uh, artwork that comes out. I think some of the ones that are just you know, like totally winging it. I always like looking at them, and then you can see like somebody who has this hidden artistic talent. Like Annie had some really, really great artwork, and Amber was drawing some beautiful ones. Coralie, you made two or three of them, right? Yeah, I made. Um I'm actually like trying to post it right now on Instagram and tag Nautilus in case oh, they repost me <laughs> oh. so people can see. But I I like making, uh, I like cutting like the styrofoam out and making little legs. I'm building my octopus styrofoam cup army. Hmm. Was it Lynette that's done the same thing, I think? Where she was talking about cutting it out, making it look like little tentacles coming down. Well, that was pretty interesting. I haven't seen that technique before. Yeah, I want to see it. Did you? Here. Was this the cup that just came up? No, no, this was from before, but here. This is the before. And after. Oh, that turned out really cute. Yeah. Oh. Dan, would you like to see? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're drawing that and cutting it out, are you thinking, actively thinking of how it's going to shrink? Not really. I just kind of <laughs> let it, kind of just let it happen. <laughs> so for those online, since Coralie is now tagging her cup, you might be seeing them on the Nautilus Live website coming up. I cannot, I ran out of inspiration for the one uh, on this trip, or the one that's ascending right now. It was definitely not as cute as the other one. I tried an experiment this time and tried to see if cork would compress or not. And it definitely got smaller, but not a lot smaller. Definitely looks just like a small cork. It doesn't look like it clearly like <laughs> shrank. I, and that was on the last one, right? Yeah. I saw that and I was like, I wonder who this is. We, I've, um, on some other systems, we've had a camera set up on our cup crusher. And it's always very entertaining to watch them on the way down. Yeah, that's awesome. Ooh. I wonder if the cork uh, shrank and if so, how small it got and then if it grew again on the way back up. Yeah, I was wondering that as well. Uh, 
Uh, message online, do we ever hire scientific illustrators or graphic designers? We actually have a graphic illustrator or a scientific illustrator coming out later on this season. I don't remember what expedition she's on, though. Um, Falcor, Schmidt Ocean Institute's ship Falcor always sails with an artist, and they have a whole artist at sea program, so that's something to look at for them as well, is every expedition sails with some form of artist. Oh, is that who's coming on? No, this is somebody that just messaged us. Like, the illustrations are beautiful. Yeah, this is really cool stuff. One of the engineers I used to work with was an art miner, and it was so cool to sit in a meeting full of engineers and technicians and talk about a design or something, and he would sit there with a sketch pad and be sketching up whatever we were talking about. And as the meeting would progress, he would tear off the page and toss it to the middle of the table for everyone to look at and then start drawing another one, and he would have this kind of graphical artist representation of where we started and where we wound up and some of the drawings as concept you know like almost made it into a manual there that that good that's awesome yeah. i think one of my favorite kind of art traditions on on research vessels is the decoration of sentry so the national deep submergence facility at woods hole has an autonomous vehicle called sentry um, and that team has a tradition of using tape different colored electrical tape as a cruise progresses to decorate um, the vehicle. Hmm. And I've always enjoyed seeing the pictures of however they decorated Sentry as the cruise has progressed. They put new tape for every cruise? Yep. Interesting. Ooh. So the artist that's coming out later this season, uh, when we were in Rhode Island, it was so neat because kind of the same thing that Dan was saying. We were sitting there in Rhode Island, and whatever she was hearing, whatever presentation was going, she would just kind of start sketching it. And so her illustrations were so beautiful at the end of every day. And uh, one of them she got to do was the different eyeballs of creatures from the deep sea. So she was working on that one, and it was so interesting to see, like, this specific octopus versus uh, this squid versus this fish. I'm always in awe of, art of, the, of all the artists out there. And Lynette, your undergrad was in art, wasn't it? It was, yes. I just found this out earlier today. <laughs> that explains the wall of post-it notes to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I had almost nothing to do with this wall of post-it notes. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so which one is yours? Because you said almost nothing. Um, I have a snailfish up there. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see it. I like the tripod fish. I like the coral. Yeah, there's a lot of good ones. And then one down at the bottom looks like something I would draw. Looks like stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> there's some of those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my artistic level. I think those are from 8 to 12. Yeah. 8 to 12 shift. Yeah. I think they were even taking requests online for what? things to draw. So crazy. <laughs> so our next expedition is going to start June 16th. And so we get back into port on June 13th. Uh, we'll do a quick turnover. And then on June 16th, the next expedition will depart and they will be mapping northbound up towards British Columbia where the next expedition will be taken to uh, Ocean Networks Canada. They actually bumped it up a day. It's yeah, not leaving. Oh, now it's June 13th. 15th. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So how many samples do y'all have to process tonight? I know y'all got to 200 samples total. Yep, so that puts us at 14, I think 15 samples we got processed. Looks like 20 to me. Or, okay, yeah, 20. 
What if we collected another sample so we had Can, 201? Yeah, 201. Trip yeah, that Niskin bottle on the way out. <laughs> I think that would be some very unhappy people. Yeah, they were <laughs> very excited about hitting the round number. Yes, they were very, very excited. I don't hear anyone saying anything, saying that that's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Since no one's saying Don't collect another sample. <laughs> <laughs> we are always listening. <laughs> it's like the voice of God from down in the, <laughs> down in the lounge. <laughs> I'm very interested to see the coconut that's brought up. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I was learning a little bit more about that because I was like, "What? It's so random that they just decided to pick up a coconut." Grab a coconut. But apparently, it's because they thought it was a rock. That's Is that really what happened? <laughs> that's what happens when you rock? don't have a geologist <laughs> on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, but what about Brian Solshfield about the... I uh, was the begged for that sample, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I know, so I thought it was silly, and then Brian was talking about deep sea wow. botany. botany yeah. Yep. yeah. So it's a really good thing that they grabbed the coconut. Yeah, now we have more samples to add to this study. Question It doesn't really, it's not a study yet. It's a curiosity quest that may turn into a study. Does a, if it's botany, does it have to be live plants or can it be detritus? <laughs> I don't know. We write a paper and call it something and we'll make a new name because that's right. what biologists do. <laughs> this is the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way. <laughs> Daryl, did anyone tell you what all those buttons do over there yet? <laughs> oh, God. No? That's pretty mean of them. Uh, we have <laughs> 80 minutes. <laughs> give him the give him the nickel tour, Ren. Oh, Ren, can you do it on SPL? I want to learn too. Uh, I can certainly try. Um, I guess we can start with which one not to touch. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, don't touch any of the joysticks. I'm, cause just, I'm just kidding, Ren. <laughs> you can touch any of them over there you want, Daryl. Wait, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how else is yeah. going to figure out what they do? <laughs> There's yep. X and Y control on your right. X and Y, yep. yep. There's your good old pan and tilt for the camera. There's depth, which I think is the Z, posi yeah, Z position for the ROV, so ascend and descend. There's stick lock, which is on now to make sure we stay going up and forward. Uh, a variety of auto depth, auto heading, X, Y controls. And if you go to the GUI, uh, do we broadcast the GUI over uh, Nautilus Live? I don't believe so. No. Okay. Here's a thruster map for verts, um, forward and lateral, and the red bars kind of indicate there. How much pressure you're pushing? Exactly. Well, I don't know if that's the exact metric they use, but it definitely represents like how hard they're working. So right now, you can see we're kind of going up and forward to keep the tether tight. Compass, yellow dot is the auto heading target if it's on. Red arrow is Herc bearing. Green arrow is Atalanta bearing. All the good stats, groundfall indicators, temperature, hydraulics information. Um, let's see what else we got. <laughs> If you go to hotel, what? The hotel tab, yeah, right hotel there. <laughs> hotel services. So. Yeah, that's I, what I was like. Actually, I, we already know you have that, Brian. I don't <laughs> know the origin of why it's called hotel. This is what, how we order room service in the front row. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nah. Yeah, so you've got all your tabs here for various instruments, ranging from hydraulics, sensor science, etc., lights, cameras, where you can pretty much toggle on and off various equipment. Um, there's a relay isolation tab, which I have not explored very much, but I gather you're able to electrically, uh, Dan can correct me if I'm wrong, but you can electrically isolate some systems for the sake of troubleshooting or locomotion performance. You are correct. I don't know what half those buttons do either. But <laughs> nice. Those are Robert buttons. <laughs> <laughs> hydraulics, which oh, is all the hydraulic. This is my favorite tab by far. Got a lot of control. Yeah, there's a lot of, st well, this entire thing is for the for the magnum arm. So 
that's just for rolling different joints on that. But you also have all your sample trays, sample jars, porch, and then the T4 uh, variable current is for the suction. I don't think any of the others are being used for anything right now. Uh, oh. oh, that's a touch screen, hit zero. Yep, yep, there you go. <laughs> Make sure not to press that. Wait, you get a touch screen? Yes, you didn't know that. Why don't I get a touch screen? <laughs> I oh. even have a touch screen. <laughs> Um, Those little controllers up there. Corley, you're not talking yeah. to her. No, she oh, is. Am I? oh, yeah, I'm on SPL now. Oh, no. She's trying to get you off SPL. You're muted. <laughs> the whole band. Of I can't hear you at all, Corley. Yeah. Your science left, right? I have science left on, I have SPL on, I can't hear you. She's very low Speak on the... Louder. <laughs> you actually may be muted. Question from our online viewer. What is your favorite ocean-related book? Mine is Zuby and the Zooks, a story about coral bleaching. I love this whole series by the author because it talks about like um, the bacteria that live inside of uh, corals and how they work together, symbiosis, in order to survive and make the reef strong. Love this whole series. They definitely don't dumb down the science. Um. Coralie, if you want to say a rock-related book, that'll work, too. <laughs> favorite, what was the question? Favorite, favorite science book? Favorite ocean-related book. Ocean-related book? Um, like a children's book? Any of them. Oh. Um, I really like Marine Geochemistry 3rd yeah. Edition. Oh. <laughs> So Adam, if you're listening, Marine Geochemistry is Corley's <laughs> favorite book. No, um, they actually have the this book. I don't know, favorite favorite science or ocean book feels hard, but they have a book on Nautilus that's a children's book, and it tells the story of um, Marie Tharp, who is... Oh, If the Ocean Could Talk? I can't remember what it's called, but it's... Um, it's about Marie Tharp, who's a geologist, and she discovered uh, mid-ocean ridges. Um, but since she was a woman, and it was like the 50s, um, she wasn't credited with it until kind of recently. Um, and she was working with two, like two, you know, professors or doctors of geology. And uh, when they first, she was the first person. Uh, she was doing like seafloor bathymetry, and when she showed all of these volcanoes. Um, their immediate response was like, oh, like we dismissed it because we thought it was like woman's talk or something like that. Um, but she ended up being right. And that's how we kind of uh, discovered more about plate tectonics. So she's actually really instrumental in our understanding of geology. Um, but wasn't credited until recently, but it's a story about her and discovering that. I'm really, really, really glad you said that, Corley, because a couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago, um, one of the SPF's deliverables, so if you're an SPF, you have to create a lesson plan or some kind of deliverable. Uh, so an SPF two years ago did like a read aloud, like story time at sea on that book. So everybody that was on that expedition uh, read a page of this book. And if the viewers go to nautiluslive.org, under resources or story time at sea, you'll be able to see everybody reading the book. Um, and it's so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So Christopher Klaus, who is coming out later this summer on a different expedition, uh, he's one of the ones that helped create it. Very cool. Brian, what about you? What's your favorite ocean book? You know, I'm really, I'm really struggling with that one. Um, nothing is quickly coming to mind. Um, what about why the winged whale sings? Never read it. I don't know that one. No, that's fluke. Oh, fluke. Oh. Yeah, fluke. 
There you uh, go. Thank you. I have to admit that one did. That was I. That was one of the ones I was thinking about answering. It's up there. Um, Alan Longhurst, 2006, Eco Geography of the Sea, definitely comes up. But that's a textbook. <laughs> um, I. Uh, Nathaniel Philbrick's um, history, the U.S. Exploring, Exploration Expedition, is probably up there. But I'm trying, I'm not coming up with a good, I don't know, I'm not sure. That's a really hard one. I actually don't read that much about the ocean, frankly, when I, for not, for not, you know, work nonfiction. Chris, what about you? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, well, Wait, okay. Uh, no, no big uh, red blinking lights. Out there, I guess. One fish, two fish, red fish, <laughs> blue fish. That's a good one. Uh, Such a classic. <laughs> I think um, wow, there's a bunch that I read for school that I really actually like. They're enjoyed. not red. But uh, oh, they I really are. like the Lost Messiah of Cortez right by there. John Steinbeck. That's, that's probably one of my favorite ocean related ones. What about the one you're reading right now about navigators? That one's it's really good. It's called We the Navigators. That's all about um, the uh, Micronesian and Melanesian and Polynesian navigation uh, before compasses and GPS and all that. And it's really interesting. I've been enjoying it a lot. Nice. <laughs> Daryl, do you have a favorite ocean book? Uh, for adult for or children? For nonfiction uh, children, The Ventures of Vin Polytheme. It's a pretty good series. I have never heard of that one. Yep, it's a book that was randomly given to. to you can find it, Adventures of Vin Polytheme, and. It's a little bit different because it's uh, a adventure where uh, this kid is a uh, his parents is uh, shipbuilders and he's a part of that business and and the adventure as it goes he ends up um, being shipwrecked and marooned for a while and is saved by the wildlife it's it's kind of a cool book sounds interesting cool oh yeah. <laughs> Randy, you got one? Yeah, the Parker O-Ring Handbook. <laughs> <laughs> that is my favorite ocean engineering, regular engineering, and maritime related book. <laughs> That's the dorkiest answer so far. I'm impressed. It's amazing. It has so much information about O-Rings and how to apply them. It's got lots of tables for gland sizes and all that good stuff. It's great. <laughs> I, I thought, thought I was the only one, right? Okay, well, I thought yeah. Corley and I were going to win with tech, with graduate level textbooks, but <laughs> I think Ren wins. I was also going to say I read a paper about commanding uh, ROV manipulators using a 3D mouse with uh, kinematics transforms instead of like the jointed mechanism, and it worked pretty well. But they the researchers showed it to a bunch of ROV pilots, and they hated it. They wanted to go back to their old school mechanism. Is that uh, is that done up in um, in a simulator somewhere? Where no, they actually a, they deployed that in a and yeah they did it on a a real working ROV on a gas platform in uh, Norway, and it worked. It, it did work, and it they were able to use the space mouse to control the manip and do operations. But the pilot said they didn't like it. They wanted to go back to their normal craft or their normal shilling manipulator. So the reason they're not popular, they. That, that has been done in real life before, and it's um, Cartesian control yep. with the space mouse, and it's pretty popular for like the nuclear and defense industry, where you're, you know, poking around with a manipulator inside of a nuclear reactor, for example. And uh, but you get, yeah, it's it's slow is why they don't like it because you get X Y Z, and you got to press a button to get rotation. Can't do. I've not seen it where you can do both at the same time. Mm. So definitely not the best for out here then. 
What's that? I said, so definitely not the best uh, manipulator for out here. Yeah, it's it's really accurate, but because of the nature of a, a space mouse or a 3D mouse, you can get either translation or rotation, but you can't. I guess I suppose you could do two. I've always wanted to try two, like one for each hand, but then you would, you know, need both hands to run the manipulator. But I think that would be kind of cool. The other thing that they commented on was that if they had to position the joints of the manipulator specifically to like fit into a tight space or to accomplish a specific task, it was harder to do that with the space mouse than it was with the little jointed controller. Yeah, harder e equal being slower. Right. Where, you know, time is money, dollar a second kind of mentality. So, sorry, back row, I kind of hijacked your book conversation nope, with a bunch I of engineering it. jargon. Do it. I have a real answer to that question. I thought that, that was your real answer. answer. That was yeah. the engineering answer, but... <laughs> That could be your I, real answer. That's all right. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a uh, a uh, nonfiction book. I think it's called The Sea Wolf. It's a biography written about uh, someone named Thomas Cochrane, who was a uh, a ship naval captain in the British Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars, and he's a really interesting character. I recommend everyone give him a quick Google. Yeah, I read that book. It's really good. Yep. I think my mom read that book. What is it? Sea Wolf. I believe there's a Jack London book by a similar name. Oh, though. yeah, that's what I'm thinking uh, of. Maybe I'm thinking yeah, of. I've read the Jack London book. Yeah, as I don't I. know the other one. Um, I'm just seeing the one by Jack London, but... Ship? Try biography as a search term. Sea Wolf class submarine. Sea Wolf. Uh. Wolf Island. Oh, there it is. Sea Wolf, the daring exploits of Navy, Navy legend John Berkeley. Or no, Buckley. Okay, I was wrong. It's called Cochrane the Dauntless. <laughs> I did read a really interesting book out here last year about uh, submarine warfare. Uh, Blind Man's Bluff or Dead Man's Bluff? Yeah, Blind Man's Bluff, I believe. Have you read it too? I don't, um, I don't think so, but I have heard of it. Oh yeah, Blind Man's Bluff. bluff. Dan, do you have a favorite book? Favorite ocean book? Uh, favorite ocean book? I don't know. Does Lord of the Flies count? <laughs> <laughs> it's an island book, I guess. <laughs> uh, I like to check out with some Pulp Fiction, like Clive Cussler. I mean, Clive Cussler is an ocean book. Like, yeah. all of his books are ocean. I'll give it that. Mm, probably yeah. burned every one of the Dirk Pitt and Oregon File novels at some point out here. definitely have not read all of them, but I have read the majority of them. For as many times as Fluke has come up on this cruise, I'm going to have to reread it, I think. <laughs> I read it in college, so it's been a while. I have it waiting for me at home to start reading. Ordered it on Amazon, like, on the first week. Found the name of the book. What is it? The Lost Journals of Vin Polytheme series. Cool. It's a good uh, child's book. It's pretty good. Easy reader. I read a really good book a while ago, a sci-fi book, about, uh, <coughs> it was basically sentient life the on one of the moons or planets somewhere, Europa or something like that, Titan. But the thermal vent life was sentient, and they were uh, warring with each other. It was, it was pretty. It was out there, but pretty good. I cannot remember the name of the author. Mm. 
maybe in a couple of years we might find out that that was true when Pablo uh, straps his laser on the back of a, a rocket going up there. Totally. Are you sure a 4,000 year old coral's not such it somehow, somehow aware? I mean, if you want to get into talk about alien intelligences <laughs> that would be so alien as to be foreign to us, yep. maybe, probably not. Their neural network structure looks pretty minimal. I really hope they're not sentient, considering how much we've sampled them. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of viewers online have said their favorite books are The Soul of an Octopus, which I want to say somebody on, or on board was reading that one, and Water Baby, the story of Alvin the Submersible. Those are great books. Who was the uh, Alvin book written by? Uh, Victoria A. Kalar, K-A-H-A-R-L. You know, I will say, I don't know if it's my favorite, but other, like, ridiculous ocean stories is um, Shadow Divers. That one's just absurd. On what is that one? It's about uh, a group of divers uh, who find and identify uh, a U-boat off the coast of New Jersey um, in the early days of technical diving, recreational technical diving. How do you spell her name again? K uh, K A H. K A H. A R L. Thank kind you. of a weird spelling, right? Yeah. But Victoria A. Kalarl. But I found it on Google if I typed in "Water Baby: The Story of Alvin." So for those online, we are ascending up on our very last dive. Very last dive for the expedition. And then is it starting tonight or tomorrow? We'll start heading back to Honolulu. Oh, as soon as the yeah. vehicles, as soon as the vehicles back, are secured. We'll, uh, we'll hit a few, like, we won't take the, you know, straight, straight line back. We'll fill in a mapping gap here and um, edge map here and there. So we'll take do some zigging and zagging to be efficient with in terms of collecting some data on the way back. Um, but no, we're going to turn north as soon as the vehicle's secured and the sampling is done and he start heading north. Okay. 86 hour ride, give or take. Yep. So during that 86 hours, it's time for me to start breaking out the needle point. We're going to be pounding pretty good. I don't know how much precision Roger. you want to do with a sharp object. Oh, <laughs> maybe so, not. Yeah, the, the, the waves and wind are not ideal for human comfort while moving north in this part of the world. Oh, OK. So for my deliverable, I'm trying to make a uh, the flapjack octopus, the octopus that like wraps up in itself. I'm trying to make that into like a needlepoint bookmark to where it'll be like, here's the cute little flapjack octopus. There he is being shy. And then there he is like curled up on himself. I spent way too much time designing it um, on the needlepoint app. So now I'm like, I've got to do it. Got to stick through it. Biologist question, 
how come we don't see any fish as we're ascending? Oh, we totally do. Um, it's they're kind of lurking in the shadows, or they're really small. We saw something that was pretty good size a few minutes ago. Oh, there's a siphonopole. That's a fish. Nope, that's a fish. Thank you, fish. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, Ask and you shall receive. That looked like some kind of snipe eel. Um, but uh, but yeah, we do. They're just generally small. And we. So a snipe eel. I th I, mean, I that could have. That's my first guess, but I definitely that was not a good enough look to be sure of it. Is that like the ocean equivalent of going snipe hunting? Sure. Did you ever have that trick played on y'all when y'all were kids? Like, okay, we're gonna go out snipe hunting. You just stand behind this bush. We're gonna scare out the snipes. Hold the bag. No. no I don't remember now. Really okay. <laughs> I mean, snipes are a real bird that people hunt, though. Are they really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that was like that's like a huge. No, I know I know the joke too. Okay. Like the the okay. prank as well, but snipe hunting is actually a real pastime for some people. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, what's the joke? Yeah, well, I don't get it. <laughs> I haven't heard there, it. there, you tell people like you're going snipe hunting, and then you just have them wander in the woods, and they never find <laughs> anything, basically. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Like you stand there and you're like, all right, stay right here by this bush. I'm going to go around on the other side. You hold the bag. Hold the bag open. We're going to scare this snipe and it's going to run into the bag and you got to grab it really, really fast. So get prepared. And like you have the person like all crouched down, ready to go. And of course, yeah, you're in the woods or some brushy area at night. And then you just walk off. <laughs> <laughs> the maritime equivalent of that is tell the newest homesickest person uh, that they have to go stand on the bow and make sure we don't pass the mail buoy, <laughs> <laughs> where they, you know, where other ships hang mail and messages, and that's how we trade. Well, it's not how we do it, but <laughs> that's the thing you do to, to, to the newest person who wants a letter from home. You go, go stand on the bow and make sure we don't pass the mail buoy. We sometimes miss it and we won't get a letter for another two weeks. But if you see the mail, mail buoy, you might get a letter from your mother or girlfriend or whatever, or something like other. Calibrate the. Radar while you're up there. Yeah. There's a couple of pythons in a hat. Or get the compass grease. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever made the crossing, Brian, from here to the mainland? Uh, from Honolulu all the way to the mainland, yeah. Did you go, depending on the time of year, go north and then east for the. No, we trade went pretty. Let's see, we or? went. I went from Honolulu to. San Diego in September, October. So you go south and then I think west, we went so pretty much straight. Really? I don't think we mm -hmm. played a lot of games with the current or whatnot. We just put the Great Circle route into the computer and went. Are the like standard <coughs> shipping lanes, are they a straight shot or do they play with the currents and the winds? It, they're, they're <laughs> it like mixed. The sailboats it's do? a mix. I think they do. I think they used to not because it was they didn't have mm -hmm. a good enough information, but now with there are more and more vessel routing services that are kind of trying to optimize that. A couple of companies so far, Ocean being one of them, are trying to provide higher and higher resolution observations with floating drifting buoys and stuff and I think that's more of a thing as shippers really feel the pressure to reduce their carbon footprint mm -hmm. they're doing a better job of trying to ride the currents um, but I think that's kind of a resurging tradition um, that used to be you know standard practice previously but post World War II when ships started going 20 knots and just got bigger and bigger they just went the, the absolute shortest period shortest distance which is not a straight line on a flat map. It's actually a curving uh, arc over the circumference of the Earth, usually north or south, bending around, right. uh, following the curvature of the Earth, and it's called the Great Circle Route. I meant to ask the captain what, his, what route he was going to take, and I keep forgetting about it. Yeah, I think every time I did a, a large crossing, we just took the Great Circle Route. So I've done Hono, Honolulu to Guam and back, and then I've done Hawaii to the East Coast, where the really big, like, multi-week, no turns, mm -hmm. or one turn every three days for a fraction of a degree to maintain the curvature route.
We have a viewer who said that since they asked the fish question and it just instantly showed up, we now need to ask, why don't we ever see bags of million dollars just floating up on the way, on the way up? Well, if we were in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We just, we just don't broadcast that. Yeah. <laughs> They pay for all your laundry bags that we uh, constantly <laughs> use. Yeah, that's what the kill all button at the video stations for. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they just find a big pirate ship uh, over in the Caribbean a couple of years ago? Like it was worth like mil billions of dollars. And they used like an AUV to find it, I think. That's another interesting uh, ocean related book. Ship of Gold, I think. I forget what it's actually called, but it's the story of these treasure hunters trying to reclaim a uh, a ship, a ship that sunk off the U.S. East Coast that was full of gold. That was um, um, Mel Fisher, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, uh, no, not Mel Fisher. Mel Fisher was the um, was he found um, the galleon in on the Keys that the name is eluding me right now. Hmm. Clive Custer also wrote a book about I think it's called Sea Hunters. Yeah. About all his shipwreck searching endeavors. Yeah, when it was non-fiction books. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, Ship of Gold in the Deep Blue Sea by Gary Kender is a, it's an interesting read about some crazy gold hunters and some of the, um, frankly, early work to invent ROVs was done by this group to be able to salvage the gold from um, this the ship SS Central America. Chris, there's a buried tr treasure legend over at Palmyra, isn't there? Yes. The Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. It's the legend of the Esperanza. So in 1816, there was a ship called the Esperanza that was full of, of Inca gold that took off um, to well, hide the treasure or escape with this treasure. And they got waylaid at sea by another ship. There was a big, epic sea battle, apparently. I'm not really sure which vessel won, but whoever won took the vessel that was still floating and made off with the treasure and ended up shipwrecking on Palmyra. And the crew all came ashore, buried the treasure, and then they split up. Uh, some people went off, like built a little raft and went off to try and find help. They never were seen or heard from again. So then the next group decided to, sp to build a raft and go yeah. off. And there was one survivor from the whole, the whole uh, like, cruise. And he passed the story down orally. And when he got back, to, he got made it back to California and got res rescued in California. And several people had heard the story or the, the legend that this guy's um, telling of it and went to look for the treasure. No one was able to find it. So... Supposedly it's still there. They're guessing it's on either Home Island or Paradise Island somewhere. <laughs> but or maybe we've already found it and, and just yeah, <laughs> haven't told anybody. Yeah. yeah, Dan, the ship Mel Fisher found was the Atosha. That's right. It's been years and years since I've been back there. Checked up, get to lift up one of the gold bars and go through this museum there. Yeah. Oh, wow, what is oh. this? Sparkly. A fish just oh ran into God. us. It's a I don't think there's much moves. left. <laughs> it's a treasure. So now we know where the otoliths come from at the bottom of the seafloor. <laughs>
So question online, do we get to help out in the wet lab? Coralie and Brian, yeah, and Chris, all three are in the wet lab all the time. Not really. Not really. Not no? Really, <laughs> really the data loggers yeah, handle Chris. that. But anybody's welcome at any time. Come <laughs> in and help. A stinky wet lab. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, it's not too bad on this this particular expedition. It's always nice and cold in there. Yeah. It is very well air conditioned. Not when we're working in there, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's it hot, gets, real it quick. Warm real quick, yeah. Yeah, well, all the scientists are running around trying to. And the doors, you know, yeah. opening and closing and everything, yeah. And the hoods on. Interesting looking shrimp. Yeah. So we're about 500 meters, um, which is where I would expect we'll start picking up the scattering layer sometime soon. We may or may not notice it. Sometimes it's super obvious, sometimes it's not. But you're going to have a better chance of seeing things in the Atalanta view, like that snot castle we just passed. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is there a particular camera angle that is optimal for that? Down is better. Uh, okay, copy that. Yeah, we're getting into it now, I think, with the team. They've seen two or three Tina 4s in short order, a couple Siphon 4s. Oh, yeah, there they are. We're starting is that to see a Tina 4 yeah. there? Yep. I haven't seen many of those on this. No, we haven't. We've, the water column life overall has been a little surprisingly light. It's because there's nothing for them to eat here, or just that's. I mean, it, yeah, I think this is lower pro lower product surface productivity in this area than a lot of other places. We're north of the equatorial upwelling. We're nowhere near any co coastal upwelling, so there's less productivity out here than there are in other parts. But yeah, there's little gelatinous things everywhere now in both camera views. Tina 4, they're so cool to see. Brian, do you have a favorite creature that you love seeing down here? Whether it's in the deep sea or in the water column. I don't know if I have a particular favorite. I do really like the Tina 4s. I get oddly excited about benthic Tina 4s. That might be my favorite kind of strange thing. I find when those super long tentacles coming off the corals that are barely visible, but once you get the light right, they're super visible. I don't, I don't know. I've always found them to be unique and different. Oh, question, what is the deep scattering layer? So deep scattering layer is just a um, <laughs> an area in the water column that has denser life, um, and it migrates up and down um, and as depending on the, the light at the surface. So the phytoplankton stay at the surface all the time, um, and the things that eat the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, um, come up at night to eat, feed on the phytoplankton, um, but go down below in the dark uh, in order to hide during the day and that just causes a giant chain reaction of um, of movement through the water column with the bigger bigger and bigger organisms following the phytozooplankton as they move through the water column so it's ascending right now getting shallower um, as it gets late in the day here uh, and the reason it's called the deep scattering layer is it was first identified in ship's sonars as this odd feature in the water column that scattered the sound. And so, uh, and you can see it in basically any of the scientific, so mid to high frequency scientific sonars we have on here, there is very clearly a layer of stuff in the mid water, um, and that's where it got its name from. It's the world's biggest migration. It happens every day in, in all the world's oceans and contains probably some of the most, the 
largest amount of fish biomass per species. The fish are all pretty small, um, but the bristle mouths and things like that that are out here, there are literally trillions of them, and they each only may be a few grams, but in aggregate across the ocean basins, it's probably the most biomass of any specific species uh, on the planet. And then there's all kinds of other things like ketignaths, arrowworms, and uh, invertebrates in that, and all the, um, you know, all kinds of life um, all hang out around in the scattering layer. So if it starts at around 500 meters, uh, where does it kind of taper off? So it, it, it's a thin, it's a fairly thin band, uh, only, you know, uh, 100 meters or so in thickness, and it mo moves from the surface down to as deep as 1,000 meters and moves up and down. So I was just kind of guessing it'd be about 500 meters now because it's in the process of ascending um, as we get a, a couple hours away from sunset here. Awesome. And, and if you're in a coastal area where the, you have the variable seafloor in within 1,000 meters, the scattering layer actually gets trapped on the bottom. And that can be really interesting if you've got the ROV down and the scattering layers interfacing with the seafloor. Um, that's a, a recipe for a really dense benthic community and lots of stuff alive in the water column. Um, and in submarine canyons, it gets concentrated in the canyon heads because it settles down the slope and then gets kind of pinned against the seafloor. Um, and I've seen the areas uh, in the New England canyons and that's so thick with life, it, it, in, you can't see very far with the ROV, or Sirius won't, or Atalanta won't be able to see um, Hercules because the, there's so much life in the water column it, that's been concentrated in the head of these submarine canyons. That's so interesting to think about, just all the, the different life that's trapped down there, or not so much trapped, but pinned. It's, yeah, it's hard for people to see in the ocean um, the differences because it all just like water. Mm. But the, the different ecosystems and biomes and however you want, ecotones, whatever term you want to apply, meaning you know, of different regions, is every bit as sharp in the ocean as it is on land, a desert versus a rainforest versus you know, a temperate grassland. Um, all that kind of range of variability exists in the ocean. Humans just don't have the senses to see it without the use of specific tools. So what's the chance of seeing a whale shark in this deep scattering layer? I uh, see that on the uh, last dive checklist there. Not zero, but low. <laughs> I've only once ever encountered a whale shark with an ROV. Oh, but it was at like 260 meters, so. Okay, we're we're getting there, slowly but surely. So we got a question from SCF Christopher Klaus. Hey, Chris, uh, what are your future plans, or what are your hopes for your careers? My future plans involve going home, sleeping for like a solid day, surfing, beach. Kayaking, that's my future plans right now. Huh. Future plan is preparing for a conference. It's Goldschmidt. I will be presenting there on Monday. Come to my poster and <laughs> network with me there. It's in France. And I guess future career plans are finishing my PhD. <laughs> um, I'm going hiking for a couple days right after I get back and I just finished my PhD work, um, and so I'm going to try and goof off as much as humanly possible for the next few months, nice. and then to figure out what I want to do when I grow up after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Uh, my future, immediate future, I'm going back to Seattle for a couple months, which I'm really looking forward to summer in the Northwest, and working on my boat and camping, hanging out on the water, and then in August I go back to Palmyra. And then I would love to have another cruise on the Nautilus if possible, but 
I haven't thought much past past the fall. So. Nice. Amber, since you're now joining us, what are your future plans or career goals? Well, uh, right when I get back, I have um, I'm shooting motocross, <laughs> and then I'm um, shooting, yeah. uh, DPing a couple of short films in July. Then I'll be back on uh, Nautilus in September. Ooh, which expedition are you going out on? Oh, okay, gotcha. Going to the monument. The Ooh, that'll be Papa a good Hanna. one. Yeah. Yes. Renner, Daryl, do y'all guys want to say what your future plans are or your career goals? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, my future goals is when I get on shore to uh, try to get into video uh, engineering and shading during live events, really try to get into the field and do more and hopefully get on a mobile truck at some point. That's my goal after I graduate college next year. That'll be cool. Yeah, um, it's fairly exciting. It's even more exciting that I got on this um, to be able to do it now, and then hopefully in the future I'll do more of it. Yeah, Ren, what about you? Well, uh, in the immediate future, I'm going to go back to California, do some climbing, and then I'll uh, go back to grad school and hopefully finish up my master's. But I'd love to continue to be an ROV engineer. I love to work for the o for the OET a little bit more. I'd uh, really love to try and become an Alvin pilot for Woods Hole at some point, or uh, yeah, just anything to continue doing the underwater engineering stuff. That's amazing. Lynette, do you want to say what your future career goals are? My future career goals? Or just your future plans. I said I plan on going surfing and spending a lot of time out at the beach. Um, after this cruise, I have a short nine day break at home before I come back out to the ship. Um, so I'm kind of planning on doing nothing at all for nine days. I'm that gonna sit on the glorious. couch and eat samosas Ooh. and that's it. That's it. I love those career plans. <laughs> I plan on doing a little bit of couch uh, couch sitting myself. <laughs> Excellent. I get three days off and then I immediately start working again. And to Louis K, yeah, we will always take ocean trivia. We have a really stumper question for you, Brian. And I'm sorry, but how much life is there per cubic foot on the ocean or in the ocean? I feel like that's like an impossible question. No, I'm sure someone has done that, done some form of estimate, estimation of that. Um, but I don't have the number readily available at all. I can tell you uh, pretty close to off the top of my head of what the number of biodiversity records we have per cubic kilometer in the ocean um, and it's roughly oh it's single digits I forget exactly what it was but it's roughly um, one record one museum record per 3.5 million cubic kilometers of ocean is what it averages out to be oh, that's not very much no yeah I figured it was gonna be like some really really high number
Okay, ocean trivia questions. Uh, the T, what T word is technically a wave generated by an undersea earthquake? Tsunami. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what species of uh, seal gets its cat-like name from its spotted, spotted pattern along its back? Leopard seal. Leopard. You got it. So it did say it starts off easy and then goes harder. Okay, uh, phonoids, phonrids, something, marine animals that filter feed and build homes out of chitin are also known as blank worms. And it's a lucky item as a clue. So it's a type of marine worms that filter feed, build homes out of chitin, and it might be a lucky item as a hint. Huh. This one I would definitely not know. So it's a horseshoe worm. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't think we've seen any of those on this particular cruise. No, but we did see so many acorn worms. We did. Incredible. Okay, what four-letter word is often used as a common name for several kinds of bivalve mollusks? Four-letter word. Bivalve mollusk. Clam. Clams. Clam. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> The study of whales is called cetology, and it's also the title of the 32nd chapter of what lengthy American novel? Hint, it's about a whale. Oh, we did. Okay, so this is Paula's favorite species. It's a large sea dweller, and it can reach lengths of Whoa, as large as 60 feet? I don't know if I believe in the 60 feet. What species is this? The whale sharks? Whale sharks. Well, I'm going to guess everybody's whale sharks. eager about those. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if they actually get up to be 60 feet. I want to say it only gets up to be 16. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah, th something. I've. 30 or 40 feet, I think, is what I remember. 39 feet is the largest one. Wow. Oh, wait. Okay. Hold on. No. They average 39 feet. The largest individual has been 67 or 61.7 feet. Man. That's big. That is massive. I think 30 feet's about the biggest I've ever seen. Man. Okay, a smack is a term for a large group of what? A so smack. A smack. <laughs> so like a murder is a large gathering of crows. Uh, a smack is a large gathering of what ocean animal? S squid. Jellyfish. Yeah. Do you know what you call a group of manta rays? What? A squadron. Squadron. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Okay, so this world famous fish market 
features early morning tuna auctions. What city is it in? Seattle. Honolulu. It's also the Tuskegee fish market, if that narrows oh, it down. Tokyo. Oh. Tokyo, yeah. Tokyo, yeah. What is the only fish that can move upright in the water? There's definitely more than one fish. Okay, yeah. this answer is seahorse. Seahorse or pipefish or <laughs> sea dragons. They're all similar. But oh, I understand what they mean now. Yeah. Yes. Ooh, so we have a Palmyra question. All right. But this one isn't trivia. This is <laughs> This is just a viewer <laughs> asking. Uh, is it true that there are aggressive sharks in the lagoons? Um, nah. <laughs> I, there's a mm -hmm. lot of sharks. I mean, there's you see sharks every day. And there's mostly black tip reef sharks. There's a few white tips. There's lemon sharks and gray reef sharks. And most of them are curious. They'll come up to you and just wonder what you're doing. The gray reef sharks can get a little more on the temperamental side, but they're still not going to really bother you. There has been records of tiger sharks cruising through the lagoon, but not to be verified, or yet to be yeah. verified. So, well, that would be, but uh, no, the sharks around Palmyra are really, really mellow. Cool. That's good to know. Brian, do you want to go eat? I heard it's burger night. It's burger night? Yeah. Ooh. Friday night. Oh, I meant to tell Annie when she came up here. I saved her a cinnamon roll. <laughs> Katie, I did see my very first ever hammerhead shark about two or three months ago out of Palmyra. I remember you saying that. It was one of the highlights of my life. <laughs> so I've never <laughs> seen one before. Because you were a huge hammerhead shark fan, right? Yeah, I think they're really cool. So I was, I've been wanting to see one my whole life, and I finally got to see one. That's so yeah. neat. Uh, have you heard of, like, the, the bonnethead sharks? Yep. Oh, yep. Have you seen those? Yeah, they have some in uh, Hawaii. They've oh, really? Cool. I love those because uh, they're just so weird with their little bonnet head. Yeah. Hammerheads are such neat, neat sharks. I have, I should correct that. I have seen baby hammerheads off of the sandbar in Kaneohe Bay. But you said you've been wanting to see a big one uh, for yeah, like years. Yeah, I want to see a full yeah. grown one. So. so when I was working on um, recreational fishing boats, we would always like go out shark fishing because it would always excite the customers and everything. So I remember we caught like this one 14 footer and it was just you know, you bring it up right beside the boat, you measure it with the laser. And then I was really, really happy because the captain gave them the option of keeping the shark. And then I was so thankful the customer's like, nope, let it swim off. Yeah, that's good. All right, so we have another true false trivia question coming to us from Louis Sakay. Uh, every humpback whale vocalizes or sings a song that is uniquely its own. That's false. Only the males sing. The females don't sing. And they generally sing the same song with variation by year. Yeah. You got it. All males in a population sing the so same song on a given year. So this is a body part found on seals, walruses, sea lions, also house cats. It's scientifically known as vibrissae. What is it? Vibrissae? Vibrissae, V-I-B-R-I-S-S-A-E. Don't know that one. Whiskers. Whiskers.
Okay, so Paul was a common octopus who became very famous in 2010 for predicting 12 of the 14 matches in this international sports event. The World Cup. You got it. How did you know that one? I remember that story. <laughs> Uh, bird question. The flightless cormorant is the only member of this bird species that has lost the ability to fly. Where does it live? The Lopacos. <laughs> Sorry, no, 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 I just love it. We need to have, like, Brian-level trivia questions. <laughs> I don't know, I've been not getting most of these. Okay, here's one for you, Brian. Balanomorpha are a suborder of barnacles. Um, what is their common name? Goose bar gooseneck barnacles. I don't know if that's true. The answer is acorn barnacles. I don't even know. Oh, okay. See, you say something, I'm, I just have to answer with the sound of authority and everyone thinks <laughs> yeah, I'm right. And I'm I have just no like, idea yeah, what the answer okay, was. Cool. What type of ray gets its name from the Portuguese word for blanket? This is an easy one. It's a manta ray. Manta you got it, yeah. manta ray. You mentioned do some hiking. Yeah. Are you gonna do that in or in and around Corpus or? Uh, up in New York. In New York. Oh, that's yes. right. You did mention that. That's yeah, so yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just okay. So I told you that I'm really bad at silent auctions. Horribly bad, <laughs> which is why I'm going on a golf cart tour with the former mayor of San Antonio. Um, but one of the things that I'm like, oh, this was a cool win. I won a 10-person. Bat cave tour to Brecken Bat Caves, or it's not so much going inside the cave, but staying outside when they come out at dark. And it's the largest bat colony in North America. So, me and a whole group of my friends, we we're planning it out earlier today. We're going to do this adventure cave tour. So, there's another cave right next door to it called Natural Bridge Caverns. So, we're doing like this hardcore all morning, all afternoon long cave tour. So, you go in the morning and like you're rappelling down into this cave and then like you're doing all like this very uh, supposedly technical stuff I'm sure it's like not that bad um, and then in the afternoon you're like crawling on your tummy like doing actual caving kind of stuff so we're gonna do that all day and then in that afternoon we're gonna go to uh, the bat cave and then we've we're renting an Airbnb right on a river so we can go kayaking and scuba diving in the morning so Sounds fun. awesome. I know, but I'm very much looking forward to that. And then I was researching 
I wanted to go on this really, it's this really cool river in Texas called the Devil's River. And there's so many endemic species to this one little river. So I wanted to go on it, but it's, you need a permit to get on it and it's kind of a pain. So I was instead looking at doing, um, going kayaking down the uh, Rio Grande. And there's all kinds of Native American, 4,000 year old uh, pictographs down there. So I was researching it earlier and figuring out like, what would be the best one to go to? what about you? You got some awesome stuff coming up too. Yeah, it's just been work mode in my brain so far, so I haven't really <laughs> thought of like, I know we want to go to Joshua Tree. I haven't done that yet, um, but it's going to be a little little hot right this moment, so I might yeah. hold that off until maybe the fall. Um, but yeah, want to explore my new state. I love it. I've always heard good things about the amount of national parks and like state parks in California. Oh. Yeah, I've only tasted just a small amount of it so far, just yeah. like Yosemite, and that, that's about it. Oh, Big Sur, I did do a marathon over there, and that was really cool. But yeah, looking forward to exploring the area more. For sure. Hey, Adam, welcome hey. to the shift. Oh, thank you. How was the hamburgers? No hamburgers. Oh, oh Loopy's going to be so sad. Yeah, she was just crying on the floor of the galley, <laughs> just banging Aww. it around. It's not pretty. Yeah, she... So what is it then? Is it regular dinner? Yeah. Oh. Filet mignon, lobster tail, and... Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know where they got these fresh oysters from, but they're <laughs> delicious. <laughs> Seen anything interesting on the way up? Um, I still have my fingers crossed for a whale shark. Okay. And also a million dollars floating by. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So we had a question from a viewer, and they're like, do you ever see fish when you're fl uh, going up? And so right when we asked it, right then a fish came into view and was swimming up. So I'm hoping that maybe uh, if I ask, like, hey, Adam, do we ever see a million dollars just kind of floating by? I thought I saw some fish scales just kind of... <laughs> that was shortly after. <laughs> <laughs> That's future marine snow. Yes, yeah. How do we feel about pulling that knife out and just having it in the grip for the uh, recovery? <laughs> Isn't Coralie helping out with recovery right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's Nautilus's stabbiest recovery. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Why am I not hearing? Oh. I did mean to remember to have them pull the knife out for some reason while we were down there today. I forgot. This is actually, I've been on every, a short time on every watch today. This really? completes my watch bingo card. <laughs> All right. Nice work. Spreading the love. Yeah. Well, can you consider like our 4 a.m. watch? Like, can you consider being on watch then? Because I was in the vicinity. Yeah, you were in the vicinity. <laughs> you were in the studio. No, I wouldn't count that one. We've gotten to the point where we have to use tread water to get up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, swimming up to the surface. That last 150 meters.
<sighs> so we got a riddle in, but I can't quite figure it out. So angry and two words are, or angry and hungry are two words in the English language that end in gri, G-R-Y. What is the third word? The word is something that everyone uses every day, and if you have to listen carefully, I've already said it. Ooh. Mm, let's see. Huh. Yeah, I can't quite figure it out. But I like it because the, the answer is what, but I don't, hmm. That's a stumper. Oh, sorry, Brian's what back. What is a third <laughs> word? Yeah, it's a riddle. What? Angry and what hungry. What is the third word? That's because that's a question. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. All right, I'm out. Brian, did you already eat? It was so fast. Yeah. Daryl, back in the con or the video chair. One hundred and thirty meters to go. Jellyfish. Don't don't read SPL, please. Please don't. <laughs> You can read them if you want. I'm sorry, I'm just joking.
So for those listening at home, we're at the tail end of SPL. We're about to go all quiet here. Um, this is the last dive of this expedition. And we have just finished on guillot number 10. We ascended up the south flank, up to the summit. Uh, our max depth was, I believe, 2,400. Let me do a quick check on that. Oh, 2,400, excuse me, not 22, 24. So after we recover the vehicles, we will start heading back into Honolulu and then be flying out. The next expedition will be a mapping leg up to British, Col uh, British Columbia. And they will be doing a Ocean Networks Canada, the expedition after that. So stay tuned. The ONC cruise will definitely be a lot of fun when we put the ROVs back in the water. But until then, it's going to be some mapping. Uh, go ahead. Um, no, I'm fine. Thank you, though. Definitely sure.
we've been noticing in the ADCP data, there's a pretty good current shear right at um, 100 meters. You probably just cross that. See if the mahi mahi show up. Control, go ahead. I'll stop on the winch five zero meters. Copy. Deck is control. Uh, Nautilus Bridge, not.
control van, Dick. Go ahead, Dick. Uh, can you ask Dan just to pop up to the uh, surface there with the RV so we can see if uh, we have a wrap or not? Roger. No, we're all good. Thank you. Roger. Perk past the transom. Roger. Power is secure.